conference. Um, it's, it has been a great event in the, in the morning. I enjoyed it very much. And I'm looking forward to the afternoon. We are going to have the second panel on Radio Free Europe in the Cold War. And um, I would like to introduce briefly myself. I'm Barnabas Foida from the Shea University in Komarno, Pomarom in Slovakia. And I do some Cold War um, history, including Radio Free Europe. And I have the privilege to have been a part of this uh, Cold War Students Conference for some time now, and I really appreciate. Uh, I'm grateful for Professor Bekesh uh, uh, for this privileged uh, situation. Let me introduce the members of this uh, panel this afternoon. Sarah Elizabeth Roth on my, on my left. She's a, an, an MA student at the Columbia University, and she's going to tell us something on the, on the printed propaganda around uh, 1956, if I understand well your present, the title of the presentation. David Alan Noel, uh, a PhD candidate at the Columbia University, and as far as I see it well, then some religion will be concerned in your presentation. And the third in the panel, Lotte Hoving Tenkat. Uh, she's a PhD candidate at the Columbia University and uh, also women in the Cold War propaganda. Wow, fascinating, interesting topic. Thank you very much for being here. And just one thing to note, please keep yourself to the 50 minutes uh, time limit. We will have question and answers after the panel. And also, I think it would be fair to have question and answer uh, panel regarding the first uh, Radio Free mm. uh, Europe panel, so uh, I think we can we can get down to the job. Sarah, the floor is yours. All right. uh, first of all, I just want to reiterate the gratitude that my um, fellow Radio Free Europe fellows have expressed. Um, this has been such an honor to work with the Open Society Archives and with my fellow Radio Free Europe fellows from Columbia University. So thank you very much. Today I will be talking about the uh, forgotten or often ignored role of Operation Focus in the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. This project was inspired by a research trip I took to the Eisenhower Presidential Archives in January 2016 when in conducting research into the refugee crisis following the 56 Hungarian uprising, I came across these two diagrams, which, quite frankly, I felt belonged more in a physics textbook than in a historical archive. It seemed very out of place, and I couldn't help wondering what these diagrams, which at face value seemed to have nothing to do with Hungary or the 1956 uprising, were doing in the Eisenhower archive. What was the common thread? These diagrams belong to something called Operation Focus, a print propaganda campaign launched by Radio Free Europe and the Free Europe Press in Hungary between the years of 1954 and 1956, using weather balloons to disseminate propaganda across the Iron Curtain, tipping over and sending cartons of leaflet raining across the Hungarian countryside at predetermined times and locations. And with enormous gratitude to Callie, who gave you sort of this uh, overview of the mechanics of the, uh, of the balloon operation, I'll launch into a little bit of the political aspect of it. Now, while much has been written in the past two decades on the role and reception of radio in the Cold War, and specifically the 56 uprising, print propaganda has largely been ignored in the discussion of Radio for Europe's psychological warfare campaign. And thus, in my presentation, I will begin a line of inquiry, which I will be continuing in my MA thesis, in which I posit that Operation Focus played a role in the political climate of mid-1950s Hungary by providing the population with the rhetoric of revolution and the sense that the West was invested in their well-being. Operation Focus's role in fomenting the events of the uprising have been widely ignored due to both the geopolitical and physical danger it posed to the Hungarian population, resulting in a propaganda campaign which, while less public than its radio counterpart, nevertheless contributed to the events of the fall of 56. Initially timed to coincide with the November 1954 elections, these leaflets, which describe themselves as coming from a fictionalized Hungarian national opposition movement, were designed to, quote, focus the attention of the Hungarian people upon certain legitimate means which they can continue to battle, thwart, and rent concessions from the regime. As you can see up on the screen, this program was, this campaign was divided into two phases, um, split in early 1955, 
Uh, the second phase concluded in the fall of 1956, uh, with the final leaflet drop taking place uh, three days before the beginning of the 1956 uprising, October 20th to 23rd. Um, Operation Focus was centered around a series of 12 demands, which again you can see on the screen, um, which called for various religious free, um, freedoms uh, for the Hungarian people and was actually an allusion to the 12 demands of the revolutionaries from the 1848 Hungarian uprising. Also included in Operation Focus campaigns were a wide series of pamphlets about the plight of the industrial worker and the agrarian worker, as well as stickers and a series of 20 newsletters, which I'll get to in a moment. Operation Focus was written and disseminated primarily by Free Europe Press and the Hungarian emigrants who worked for the organization based in Munich. It was designed to target those regions of Hungary which did not have the same access to radio as Budapest or other large urban areas, particularly the countryside and rural communities. While listening to the radio was a social event in these urban areas with family and friends gathering around the radio sets and discussing the topics in public spaces, um, the relative isolation of the agrarian community coupled with the increased pressure placed upon individual farmers to join farming collectives made it slightly more difficult to spread the word Radio Free Europe. Um, so, uh, so here is some, an image of some of the reporting landing sites of Operation Focus, as well as a flyer for the National Opposition Movement. And here we have some of the examples of materials that would be dropped by Operation Focus. Um, including a series of 20 newsletters entitled the Free Hungary uh, Press, which announced that we raise our voice at a time when the opposition of Hungarian people have achieved concrete results of which the world takes note. Free Hungary is a symbol of national unity. It draws together every Hungarian of goodwill. Now, while the language of the leaflets may extensive use of the first person, referring to our liberation, they were also very clearly Western in origin and made explicit in American interest in the liberation of Hungary. In one newsletter, uh, the National Opposition Movement quoted Secretary of State Dulles's quote-unquote policy on Eastern Europe, namely, the captive people should know that they are not forgotten and they are not reconciled to their fate, and above all, that we are not prepared to see illusory safety for ourselves by a bargain with their masters, which would perpetuate their captivity. And then later editions of Free Hungry Press also included a number of stories about the quality of life in the Western world with particular emphasis on the well-being of the industrial laborer. Beyond the 12 demands, the leaflets also called for basic amenities for the average Hungarian, fuel for heating, access to the electrical grid, as well as improved housing conditions. Also included in these leaflets were fictionalized or highly exaggerated accounts of Eastern Europeans seeking asylum in the West. <coughs> this is the narrative of Bella Horza, a Hungarian violinist who, while performing in Paris, sought asylum with the French police. Um, in addition, there are a number of leaflets which were specifically focused on the plight of the peasant, bearing titles such as the land belongs to those who till it and the strength of the, in the individual farmer. And in fact, the very final leaflet to be dropped in Hungary in October 56 was a leaflet designed to specifically, specifically target peasants. Unsurprisingly, uh, Operation Focus was met with mixed responses on both sides of the Iron Curtain. In Hungary, police ordered people to notify them of any, quote, landings and to deliver leaflets to a local police station, and finally to burn any leaflets they came across. Distributors of the leaflets were arrested as reactionaries or enemies of the people. And in fact, in the aftermath of the balloon landing, people in living in the local area would be stopped on the highway, have their cars, uh, would have their cars stopped, and would be interrogated about their knowledge of the leaflets. And there was also routinely searches of passengers at the Budapest railway stations. On October 15th, 1954, about two weeks after the campaign started, the government of the People's Republic of Hungary sent a protest note to the United States, denouncing the, quote, subversive campaign, complaining that the leaflets, couched in a tone of incitement and slander, should arise to satisfaction among the Hungarian people and call upon them to offer resistance to their lawful government, which is a nice summary of what this campaign was trying to do. Uh, NEM and 12 quickly appeared in all corners of the country, even those areas not directly targeted by Operation Focus, scrawled on factory walls, the sides of freight trains, on election posters, and even mailed to the homes of known communists. Friends would pass word of operation among each other in bars and factories, and would actually share physical leaflets among each other, helping to create a community of dissidents within the existing society of Hungary. For example, one man who worked in a carpenter shop talks about how he was loaned a leaflet by a friend before having to return it a couple hours later so he can continue making the rounds of his local community. Now, 
to get back to this later. On the whole, uh, there's ample evidence that many Hungarians were just as aware of the leaflets as they were of the radio programming, and that the language of the uh, the language of the subject of Operation Focus were in fact much more aggressive and dogmatic than their radio counterpart. That being said, Operation Focus has still is largely erased from the history of, the, of Cold War Hungary and the '56 uprising and Radio for Europe's involvement in both. Now, on the surface. Evan seems to suggest a simple answer, that perhaps the leaflets were not as effective a tool of psychological warfare as the radio was. This is an overly simplistic answer, which fails to take into account the rhetoric of the leaflets and their generally positive reception among the population of Hungary. Now, I would argue that this absence really comes down to three intimately connected factors. The geopolitics of the Cold War, the physicality of print propaganda, and the reception of operation focus across geographical and socioeconomic backgrounds. The concept of the Cold War status quo holds that as long as the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to respect the authority and sovereignty of the opposing superpower and made no plans to change the borders as they stood in 1945, the world would avoid outright confrontation and a potential Third World War. Thus, radio occupies a geopolitical gray area in that it's technically Western funded and Western in origin, but difficult to trace or hold up as evidence of violating state sovereignty. In London Calling, Alvin Webb, a scholar of geopolitics, argues that radio, unlike airplanes, or in this case balloons, cannot be pinpointed geographically and is therefore exempt from laws governing sovereign airspace. Um, this uh, topic is picked up by Everett Dolman in his work on geopolitics in the space age, in which he argues that the Convention of Naval Sovereignty before 1958 ex uh, extended 3 to 12 miles from a nation's uh, coastline. If you apply that to uh, airspace, then you can see that Radio for Europe's balloons were in clear violation of Hungarian sovereignty. So for example, if you look at this map right here, over here would be uh, the westernmost portion of Hungary. As you can see, most of the leaflet landings do take place along the area closest to Germany from which they were being launched. That being said, there's also a large concentration around the area of Budapest, which is located about 200 kilometers inland from the border not to mention all the landings along the southern border, essentially meaning that these balloons would spend a fair amount of time in Hungarian airspace, thus violating this concept of a Cold War status quo. And in fact, in February 1956, with strong encouragement by the Soviet Union, the Hungarian government launched a second diplomatic complaint against the US, arguing that the balloons, in addition to leaflets, were carrying aerial reconnaissance machinery. So suddenly, Operation Focus was not just a quote-unquote harmless propaganda campaign, it was actually a threat to the geopolitical status quo in Europe at the time. Um, as mentioned before, oral propaganda has the benefit of being able to evade most forms of regulation, save for jamming of signals. By contrast, print propaganda is physical and concrete in its method of dissemination and sharing. The balloons are conspicuous and obvious, the belief looks oftentimes brightly colored and immensely recognizable. Thus, this actually creates a scenario by which print propaganda could invite persecution and even violence. While in rural areas, leaflets would fall in fields and scatter across the countryside, making them more difficult to collect, in urban areas, which were incredibly crowded, these leaflets' presence was obvious and oftentimes created um, mass hysteria and excitement surrounding their landing. For example, one time they fell in the middle of a Budapest traffic jam and all of the people sitting in cars sort of like passed them around to each other. <laughs> um, and according to Hungarian officials, the act of passing out the leaflets to other persons is considered an offense against the state. But interestingly, while picking up a leaflet is a crime, sorry, it's not a crime, uh, the reading discussion or sharing of leaflets was considered to be a crime against the state. Thus, while it's acceptable to read Western propaganda, it was illegal to share it with other people. That being said, all, this created a scenario in which violence perpetuated by the leaflets was quite common. Here is just a very brief snapshot of some of the locations of reported violence against people. Um, in late October 54, the AVH performed a search of two schools in the Gior region, including a body search of students as young as primary school age, looking for possession of leaflets. Um, there are many reports that police would often use the pretext of searching for leaflets to uh, search the homes of known op uh, opponents of the communist regime, including village intelligentsia, as well as individual farmers, all creating an environment by which leaflets could be used to perpetuate violence against the individual. 
And there's a certain amount of evidence that Radio for Europe felt guilt about this. In March, I had the opportunity to speak with Professor Istvan Dayak of Columbia University, who actually worked for Radio Free Europe and the Hungarian Free Europe Press Desk during the Operation Focus. And he expressed an enormous amount of guilt for his role in perpetuating the persecution of the Hungarian people. So there is a fair amount of evidence that Radio Free Europe was aware of this and felt some trepidation about their role. Finally, uh, this in turn forms a third contributing factor as to why Operation Focus has been excluded from the narrative of Radio for Europe, namely its geographically divided reception among the population. Well, like make the assumption that Radio for Europe tend to be more easily accessible in urban areas um, where they have access to more immediate, consistent, and up-to-date information from the West via radio. Um, Operation Focus was not directly relative to their interest in qualms of the urban population, <laughs> in part because it was designed to target these areas which had less access to radio. Thus, a, a large percentage of the urban population felt that Operation Focus uh, did, wasn't directly applicable to their lives and would often have negative or neutral feelings towards the leaflets or acknowledge that they were useful for, for someone else. By contrast, peasants and, and uh, individuals living further away from urban centers tend to have a more holistic, emotional response to the leaflets as demonstration of the West's interest in their cause. However, while the uh, urban individuals weren't as, uh, didn't feel that Operation Focus was necessarily relevant to their lives, they were interested in the content of it and oftentimes felt that the rhetoric didn't go far enough with one 25-year-old student from Sombate arguing that there should be a more aggressive tone with phrases like, the number of communists in the village is comparatively small, they should be boycotted, or Hungarians try to prevent the organization of the party meetings and if possible, do not attend them. And if you look at the 16 uh, points of the, of the Budapest protesters in the 56 uprising, there is a fair amount of overlap between the rhetoric of the 12 demands and these 16 points. In part, uh, this is, uh, is it, Operation Focus ex exclusion from the 56 uprising is due in part to its focus on the activities taking place in Budapest rather than the uh, outlying regions. And this is perpetuated by Radio Free Europe as early as October, November 56 itself. When if you look at the um, daily background reports published by Radio Free Europe during this time, the activities taking place in what they call the provinces where Operation Focus was targeting tend to be buried in this report and are definitely not the focus of Radio Free Europe's attention. Whether or not this was just focusing on where the action was or actively trying to obscure perhaps what they had encouraged in these regions is, um, has yet to be determined. Operation Focus and the fictional, fictionalized National Opposition Movement of Hungary served as a call to arms uh, for the Hungarian people through a combination of domestic oriented language, dogmatic rhetoric, and the creation of the impression of Western investment in the liberation of Hungary. In bringing Operation Focus more clearly into the picture, we are once again confronted with the perennial question of Radio for Europe's role in the 56 uprising. Whether or not the leaflet campaign exonerates or further incriminates the organization in the events of 56 is still very much up for debate, but I would argue that Operation Focus helps a complicated understanding of the 56 uprising, hopefully for the better. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm sure uh, there will be some questions for you. Just please, David, uh, take your floor. And uh, meanwhile, it was fascinating to hear um, so many differences with uh, Czechoslovakia. There were mm -hmm. leaflet operations yeah. in Czechoslovakia as well, and there were some differences. Thank you very much, David. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my name is David Knoll. I'm a PhD candidate at Columbia University. Uh, I'm actually at the journalism school there. Uh, I'm doing a PhD in communications, but uh, my work has been, has evolved to be very historical in focus, so um, I'm very grateful uh, to be here. As you can see, uh, the name of my talk today is Religion and Radio Free Europe, How RFE Used Religion to Combat Communism in Strategic Eastern European Countries. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Corvinus, the Corvinus Cold War Center and the European Institute at Columbia University for organizing this conference. And of course, CEU uh, for hosting. 
and uh, for EI at Columbia for the chance to come here as a RFP fellow. I would also like to thank the International Visegrad Fund for their uh, for their generous um, support uh, for this research. Um, so, uh, before he was president, uh, General Dwight Eisenhower addressed the United States um, in a sort of rallying cry for uh, the American crusade for freedom. Um, this was a Labor Day address in September of 1950. Uh, in his solicitation of support for this crusade for freedom, he asked uh, listeners, he asked the American public to <laughs> sign what was called a freedom scroll. Um, a declaration of freedom was included in this scroll, which read in part, quote, I believe in the sacredness and dignity of the individual. I believe that all men derive the right to freedom equally from God. I pledge to resist aggression and tyranny wherever they appear on earth. I am proud to enlist in the crusade for freedom. Now, as this drive for support for the crusade for freedom um, which ultimately would support RFE, um, as this draft report makes clear, uh, religion would play a primary role in how RFE defined its goals. Uh, an RFE policy handbook of the early 1950s uh, wrote on how to rightly influence those in uh, living in Eastern Europe under communist regimes. Uh, the answer partially was, quote, by displaying the moral and spiritual emptiness of communism as an ideology. Now, of direct interest for my topic today, religion was important in how RFE attempted to influence politics and social movements uh, in these countries in its broadcasting to Eastern Europe and ultimately in how America fought the early Cold War. Uh, while religion was a major theme in RFE's broadcast to, to Hungary, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and Czechoslovakia, today I'm going to focus my research um, on broadcasts to um, Hungary and Poland in the mid-1950s, uh, largely because the most compelling material I found this past week while researching at the Open Society Archives uh, is from this time period in these places. Uh, now, I argue that America used RFE in an attempt to support religious institutions, particularly the Catholic Church, in the clash between religion and communism in the early Cold War, and that this was a uniform message across countries despite the fact that RFE was distinct from America's other propaganda station, Voice of America, um, and RFE's aim to tailor specific content for specific countries. Um, it seems to me that the tension between religious institutions and the communist regimes of the early Cold War is a somewhat underexplored topic, uh, particularly in how America used this tension to support a conception of political liberty that hinged on religious freedom. Uh, and to explore my topic today, in particular, I will uh, examine how RFP handled the persecution of Cardinal Stefan Wojcicki in Poland and similar developments in Hungary, particularly with evidence of how Hungarian listeners appreciated Radio Free Europe religious content. So first, let's take a look at the case of Wojcicki. Uh, during Christmas 1954, uh, Radio Free Europe station to Poland uh, the Voice of Free Poland used the Christian holiday to support the Catholic Church and attack the communist regime. Um, now, Christmas was a popular time for, for RFE to be on the offensive against communists. Um, in support of religion, as you can see from this image printed in the Free Europe Committee publication, News from Behind the Iron Curtain, as you can see, this image depicts a Christmas tree from what appears to be Stalin mustaches. Um, I thought this was funny. Um, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it shows how Christmas was a, a popular time uh, to be on the offensive with propaganda for religion. Uh, <clears throat> an RFE memo of the time, uh, Christmas 1954, reads, quote, at Christmas, the Voice of Free Poland broadcasts many special programs in harmony with the religious and traditional aspects of the Christmas festival. On Christmas Eve, prelates of the Roman Catholic Church from various countries together with Polish exiles, offered through, through the intermediary of the Voice of Free Poland their Christmas greetings to Cardinal Wojcicki, the primate of Poland, imprisoned by the Polish regime. Now, a study called Church and State Behind the Iron Curtain, which was published in 1955 and had direct ties to the Free Europe Committee, uh, they go through the history of the changes in Polish law under the communist regime that led to the imprisonment of Wojcicki. 
Uh, according to the study, Polish law changed in early 1953 that forced uh, the endorsement from the state for the selection of new clergy um, and as well as other similar personnel moves. And this was done to ensure state loyalty. Uh, this, among other changes, attempted to force uh, state compliance on the church. And in late September of 1953, Wazinski would be arrested. Um, in, also, in, in December of 1953, um, a, someone named Joseph Swiatlo, uh, he was part of the Polish secret police. He defected to the West um, in late 1953, after which he broadcasted uh, communist regime secrets over the voice of Free Poland. Um, Swiatlo broadcasted details of the place of, of Stefan Wojcicki's imprisonment, going through the detail to which the infamous UB of Poland had gone to create a place to keep watch on Wojcicki. Here's one short passage of the Swiatlo broadcast. He explained that, quote, if the cardinal was, open, was to open the door leading down the stairs in order to take a walk in the garden, an additional alarm would be sounded. On such occasions, a guard would leave the building by a separate special door and find himself within a few seconds in an observation pointed point placed up on a high tree. The park was surrounded by a high wall, but just to be sure, the technicians of the UB had erected a high wire netting, which would not even allow the cardinal to approach the wall. On the other side of the wall, more guards were on duty day and night. Now, an RFE memo explained how the Voice of Free Poland expanded on Sviatlo's broadcast by, quote, exposing the principles of the communist campaign against religion. Um, this was done through commentaries based on communist texts, including those of Lenin. Uh, RFE explained in this memo how Sviatlo also revealed through RFE broadcasting how certain Catholics in Poland were allies of the communist regime and even had ties with the NKVD. Uh, these, quote, pro-regime Catholics had the ire of RFE. In an earlier memo, officials explained how RFE waged a, quote, campaign against them and that they were, quote, a special target of our broadcasting. Uh, these are a few examples of the pro-religious stance taken by the Voice of Free Poland, developed by the mid-1950s. And again, while, while RFE fashioned itself as an organization that allowed different stations to tailor content for specific audiences, the record of religious broadcasting in the Voice of Free Hungary at the same time period, when compared to the record just examined in the Voice of Free Poland, shows how the pro-religious stance was uniform. So just like the Voice of Free Poland, the Voice of Free Hungary also used Christmas as a time to focus on religious content in fighting the local communist regime on its uh, religious policies. The most, the most well-known case of the communist persecution was in regards to Joseph Mincenti, um, which the Voice of Free Hungary focused on in December of 1954. And RFE Memo explains in regards to the Voice of Free Hungary, quote, in our pre-Christmas programming, we demanded that the communists make concessions along these lines, a general amnesty, the freeing of Cardinal Mincenti, the setting free of prisoners of war and civilians who have been deported to Russia, a Christmas subsidy to the unemployed and exemption from duty for gift parcels from abroad. Now, while the Voice of Free Hungary covered the events of Mincenti's imprisonment closely, a look at listener response to RFE broadcasting in Hungary will also show the pro-religious positions taken by, this broad, by the broadcaster. Uh, in an RFE memo in regards to July of 1955, we can read how, quote, a young Hungarian says that broadcasts of mass have a good and a beneficial effect, especially for people who dare not go to church because of their jobs. And in April of 1956, uh, a similar memo read that, quote, a source whose brother was a nominal member of the Communist Party, is especially grateful for RFE religious broadcasts. Neither of them dared go to Mass, and they listened to RFE's Mass broadcasts at home instead. Now, in reference to September of 1955, the Voice of Free Hungary argued that, quote, a new anti-church policy is taking shape. Also that, quote, students and teachers cannot practice religion openly, and that the, the VF H, or the Voice of Free Hungary, took a strong, strong stand against the communist's latest anti-church policy. Now, generally speaking, and not necessarily in regards to the specific time period or the specific developments referenced by RFE here, uh, they go pretty much unnamed in this memo. The communist regime in Hungary did nationalize the religious schools and imprison religious leaders. Among other ways, there was tension between church and state. And regarding August of, of 1956, an RFE memo read that 
quote, the church is cut off from religious periodicals and news, and news service. We, uh, that is the Voice of Free Hungary, demanded that the state change its attitude towards the church. Um, now, American propaganda was, was certainly met with communist propaganda in this general time period. Um, here on the screen, you can see how some of this propaganda was religious in nature. Um, although there was no description that accompanied the, this cartoon uh, found in a Free Europe Committee publication. Uh, the Free Europe Committee um, did use it uh, to accompany an article regarding communist persecution. Uh, the image shows a priest in a hat with the American flag on it, uh, pointing to a man on a cloud with Wall Street written on it next to what looks like a syringe and a bomb with the caption, uh, Thy Kingdom Come. Uh, it, a, it appears to be critiquing the church's friendship with America and possibly the violence and money interests that come with such a partnership or so claimed the cartoon. Uh, those who are from Budapest who live here might be more familiar with this publication from which it comes. And I am Buddhist Mati. Mm -hmm. um, and I was trying to look up what that was. I'm assuming it was a, from what I could find, was a, at least in this time period, was a, a ca cartoon or a, 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 a publication that was pro communist regime, at least from what I could tell. Um, maybe people can correct me on that. Um, so, uh, towards a conclusion, um, I've attempted to show today, I believe there to have been a somewhat uniform message among stations at Radio Free Europe that supported religion. Um, again, in this tension-filled contest between the communist regimes and religious institutions. Uh, while I only looked at Hungary and Poland, I believe an analysis of RFE stations broadcasting to Bulgaria, Romania, and Czechoslovakia would, similar, would yield similar results. In fact, uh, my research this past week at the OSA archive shows that at least the, religion, the, the research division of RFP was very concerned with religion in these places. Uh, and as I continue my research and as others research and write about the Cold War, I believe this contest between church and state to be an underexplored yet vital lens mm -hmm. through which to understand the topic, particularly in the early Cold War period. Uh, I don't think we understand the extent to which America tied uh, political freedoms as being inherently impossible without religious freedoms, and how America used communist persecution of religion as a galvanizer for its cause and its fight with communism. Uh, again, my analysis of RFB leads me to these conclusions as well as my analysis of Voice of America that I've done previously. Uh, while religion in the Cold War is a growing topic, as I'm sure my professor, Dr. Victoria Phillips, would agree there is much room for this topic to continue to grow. Uh, thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions.